Can you remember a time when you sat down with your favorite book or a great game or a pencil and a pad and you just read or you played or you drew and you were so absorbed in whatever it was you were doing that you entered into almost like a trance-like state and before you knew it, hours had just melted away. That very specific feeling has a name. You had an autotelic experience. You experienced a state of flow. Today, we're gonna look at flow in games using Super Hexagon as an example in this very first episode of Tiny Voices. Hope you enjoy. So what exactly is flow, you might be asking? Well, a Croatian-born professor of psychology at Claremont University spent the better part of two decades exploring that question. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi is responsible for the pioneering research into this phenomenon known as flow, sometimes referred to as being in the zone. This state of total immersion is as old as the human experience, but Csikszentmihalyi wanted to understand why and how we can enter this state. He, along with a team of researchers, traveled the world trying to understand flow. Their travels and their research culminated in Csikszentmihalyi's seminal works, two books titled Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience, and Finding Flow. Since it's not really practical to spend hours on this topic, even though I could, I'll just recommend you check those books out for the full in-depth insight from Csikszentmihalyi himself. So to answer the question I posed a moment ago, flow is a state of complete positive absorption in an activity with no promise of external reward. You do something because that activity, the act of doing it, is its own reward. And flow comes about due to some very specific circumstances. In Finding Flow, Csikszentmihalyi posits that a given activity can produce several emotional responses ranging from boredom to relaxation, to anxiety, to apathy, and so on. These responses are a factor of how challenging the activity is and how skilled the individual is at that activity. He proposes a sweet spot where the right mix of skill and difficulty leaves the individual in a state of flow, of total absorption and immersion and satisfaction. Peter Turchi, author of Amuse and Amaze, represented this balance with a very simple diagram. If the challenge provided by an activity is too low compared to the skill of the individual, the individual experiences boredom. If it's too challenging relative to the skill of the individual, the individual experiences anxiety. But when you find that balance between challenge and individual skill, the individual is able to enter that coveted state of flow. The most commonly accepted criteria for entering that state of flow are as follows. Number one, the activity one is performing must have a set of clear goals. Two, the activity must be able to provide clear feedback so that the individual can adapt to the challenge. Three, the activity must continuously challenge the individual. Four, the goals of the challenge must seem achievable. In other words, we go back to the necessity for balance between skill and challenge. Since this is a gaming channel, I want to look at flow through the lens of gaming because games are specifically designed to induce a state of flow. That's if they're designed well. Some games might allow us to experience flow for a short time, but often they cease to continuously challenge us and we become bored by them. Or they sometimes swing way too far in the other direction and present a challenge so vast that we might become anxious and thus less likely to be totally absorbed in them. Now obviously there's no such thing as one activity or one game that allows everyone to experience flow universally. It's not a one-size-fits-all deal. That's not what my argument is trying to say. I've spent a good amount of time talking about flow and breaking it down. Now I want to go one step further and apply what I've been talking about by looking at a practical example of a game that I personally think is the perfect example of a game made to induce that flow state. That game is Super Hexagon by Terry Kavanaugh. Super Hexagon, in case you don't know, is an extremely simple puzzle game where you have to navigate a cursor through a series of openings while the world spins out of control around you, and you can only move the cursor left or right while circling a central hexagon. The game becomes harder and harder over time until you complete the hexagon by surviving 60 seconds, at which point the game enters hyper mode and things speed up dramatically. 
the thumping high tempo music and the pulsing and twirling graphics add a feverish intensity to it. The game has six difficulties, the easiest of which is unabashedly labeled hard. In my subjective experience, it is wholly entrancing. Despite the fact that each run is measured in seconds, I can lose hours unchecked to this game. It's clear as day that this game puts me into a state of flow, and I'm going to be breaking down why. Again, I want to preface this by saying what activity brings me into a state of flow isn't necessarily going to do that for everybody, but merely that it has all of the hallmark elements of a game that is designed well around flow. So we're going to go back to those criteria I listed off a couple of minutes ago. So to start, number one, Super Hexagon has a clear goal and that goal is to survive as long as you can. Many people consider the goal of a run to make it 60 seconds, but truly, that's more of a sub-goal because once you make it 60 seconds into a run, hyper mode kicks in. You don't automatically enter some sort of win state. The goal is simply to survive as long as possible. Number two, Super Hexagon provides clear feedback. Games in general are usually pretty good about this, any obvious fail state is a clear form of feedback, but Super Hexagon's fail states not only provide feedback in the form of telling you that you game overed, but they also let you know how long you lasted. In a game where your only goal is to survive longer and longer and to continuously one-up yourself, this clear numerical feedback is a very strong form of feedback, one of the strongest that you can receive so that you can adjust and adapt and better your performance on the next run. Number three, Super Hexagon continuously challenges the player. Not only is Super Hexagon renowned for being difficult, which we'll talk more about later, it never stops becoming more difficult as you become more skilled. Mechanically, that's the thrust of the game. The further you make it into the run, the more challenging the patterns you run into. If you make it to the 60 second mark, hyper mode kicks in. As you become better, you unlock the higher difficulty levels as well. There's functionally no end to Super Hexagon's ability to adapt to your skill level and become more challenging to meet your rising demand for a greater challenge. This bleeds into number four. Number four is probably the most subjective element here, because some people are overwhelmed and frustrated by the early goings of Super Hexagon's easiest difficulty. This doesn't disqualify it from being a prime example of a game designed for flow. It's just a matter of talent and acumen and subjective experience. Just like some people will never find flow in Super Hexagon because the goals seem immediately unachievable, many beginners will never find intrinsic flow in playing the piano for the same reason. Still, I'd argue that because of the adaptive way that Super Hexagon handles difficulty, it more often than not leaves the player in the Goldilocks zone, difficult enough to skirt boredom, while manageable enough to skirt anxiety. What's most important is making it just a few seconds longer always seems achievable. Personally, I'm never dumbfounded and left wondering how it could even be possible to continue onwards, to continue improving. Improvement is gradual, but it's always clear that you're inching yourself towards progress second by second. And again though, nothing that I've said today about flow is specific to Super Hexagon. Or even game design. Even without understanding the nitty gritty details and mechanics of flow and the autotelic experience, game designers have a pretty intuitive understanding of these ideas and games are more often than not designed around trying to entrance you, to enter you into the zone, into that optimal blissful state of flow. Some games succeed better than others, but no game designer worth their salt wants their player to fall on the extreme side of either boredom or anxiety. So I hope you come away from this first episode of Tiny Voices with a deeper appreciation for how games are designed and how your brain responds to the activities that you love. Because understanding what makes you tick is fun. Or it is to me anyway. So that's going to be it for today's episode of Tiny Voices. Check back on the channel next Friday for a new episode where we're going to be talking about something completely different. This is going to be a six episode limited pilot run of the show. So feedback is encouraged here and now uh, more than ever. After the initial six week run of this, I'm going to go back to the drawing board, tweak it and see uh, how things fit together. But this is a cool little experiment for me. I thank you for participating in it and hopefully you learned something. That would be awesome. Uh, if you want to leave feedback, you can provide me a comment below and that would be much appreciated. 
Again, I am Dave, and this has been episode one of Tiny Voices. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take it easy. Have a good one.